wonder if you've ever been in a meeting, perhaps at work, where uh, there are two, sometimes even more, uh, groups of people or perspectives in the meeting, and those two parties have a completely different agenda to one another. And, uh, you know, this one is going here and this one is going here, and they're just completely missing. Uh, in fact, sometimes it feels like most of meetings at my work are like that. Um, and it's not just in the workplace. It can be the same in personal conversations too, can't it? That the two participants in the conversation have different perspectives, uh, different agendas. They're talking about the same thing, and yet somehow they're not talking about the same thing at all. And to me, the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus has always felt like that, like two people speaking but, but, but missing each other. And then when you think about it a bit more, you can see actually there are connections between what Jesus is saying and what Nicodemus has said. And then thinking about it some more in, in preparation for, for, for this talk, um, there just seemed a whole lot more connections than I'd seen before. And, and it's really wonderfully clever uh, what Jesus does in the way in which he engages Nicodemus and takes him from one plane of thinking onto a higher plane. And so that's what we're going to do in this first session. So Brother Roger and I were both keen to, to talk about uh, some, of the, some of the encounters that Jesus had. And uh, you know, I suggested one and then Roger suggested one and we each added another and we found that we could, we, we could find four that we were, all, we were both uh, really excited to talk about, all from John's Gospel. So we've got two from the beginning in chapters three and four and two from, from the end. So in this session, we're just going to focus um, in, on verse one to 21 of John three and try to understand how this conversation works. And we will see the cleverness of Jesus, which is wonderful just to see that and to enjoy it. Um, but of course, we're not primarily studying it because it's clever. Um, it, there's, there's wonderful teaching uh, that's important for us to, to, to embrace uh, as, we, as we look at these things. We're gonna be more focused on the, on the early verses, the first eight or so verses, but let's just take a quick look at, at the whole thing, just to understand a little bit about how it works. So you'll notice that Nicodemus says three things. Um, verse two, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And that's a statement, isn't it? It's not a question. It's a statement. Nicodemus begins with a statement. And then the second thing Nicodemus says is in verse four, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So he now, he now, he now asks a couple of questions. It's essentially the same question, isn't it? Expre expressed in two phrases there. And then finally, he speaks for the last time in verse nine, how can these things be? Which is about the most open-ended question you could think of, isn't it? So, so Nicodemus is moving from a statement to a question, a question which is, so, so it's a statement about what Nicodemus understands or thinks he understands. Then it's a question, but, but it's a question still framed by the constraints of Nicodemus's understanding about how people are born. Um, and then it's a completely open-ended question where Nicodemus manages to cut himself loose from the perspectives of how things work on earth and just lay himself open to what might be. That's an interesting, that's an interesting transition, isn't it? And it might be a transition that we need to undergo in some way. You'll also notice as we move from Nicodemus's first statement to his second statement, it gets shorter. And when we get to his third statement, it's really short, isn't it? So Nicodemus gradually gets shorter in what he is saying. And if we look at what Jesus says, we'll notice Jesus' first answer. And if you've got a words of Christ in red, this is easier to see. Jesus' first statement in verse three is relatively short. His second one runs from verse five to verse eight. 
it's quite a bit longer. And then the third one goes from verse 10 right through to 21. It's huge, isn't it, by comparison. So Nicodemus is getting shorter and Jesus is getting longer and he's taking up the slack. He's, Jesus is moving in to fill the space that Nicodemus creates for him. Oh, that we might do the same. Um, that we might make space for godly thinking, for the spiritual perspective rather than the earthly perspective. That's the journey that Nicodemus seems to be going. So by the time, you know, by the time we're in the famous verse 16, we've almost forgotten about Nicodemus. He's, he's like retreated into the background and Jesus is just talking now. It's more like a discourse of Jesus or a monologue of Jesus, isn't it? As we go from verse 10 uh, through to verse 21. And yet Nicodemus is still in the picture because right at the end of it, where does Jesus finish up? He says, everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. That's interesting, isn't it? In the light of the fact that Nicodemus was the one who came to Jesus by night. And Jesus has, sorry, Nicodemus has to come out of the darkness, doesn't he? Into the light. And that's where Jesus finishes in verse 20 and 21. And of course, we know how the story ends, don't we? Later on in John's gospel, where Nicodemus does indeed come to the light and makes that journey that Jesus is hinting about here. So that's a little bit about the shape of the chapter 3, 1 to 21 as a whole. There's just one other idea that, that, that I found quite helpful. Um, when you think about those 21 verses, Jesus starts with his focus on this rebirth by water and spirit, doesn't he? And the first eight verses are about are really about that. And then he moves in verse 9 to 14 to 15 to talking about himself, about he being the one who is in heaven and has been in heaven um, and, and, and therefore understands and can bear witness to these things. And then in verse 16 to verse 21, he talks about God, how God sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him. So we move from rebirth by the spirit how will that work? How can that be powerful, being born again? Well, it can be powerful because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how can the work of the Lord Jesus Christ be powerful? Because God sent him. There's a, there's a, there's, there's a, there's a stepping back. So there's, a, there's a broadening of the perspective. Rebirth by water and spirit because of the work of the Lord Jesus, because God planned this whole great work of salvation. And Jesus stepped back through those steps to get that bigger perspective on the whole work of God in salvation. So that's the, that's the overall framework of what's happening here. Let's now step into where we started about conversations that seem not to connect. How does the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus connect? Well, we'll just take one example to start with before we start stepping through the first eight or so verses more closely. Um, did you spot what the connection was between what Nicodemus says and what Jesus answers? Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, but no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. That's what Nicodemus says. And Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Did anyone notice any words that were common between what Nicodemus said and what Jesus said? Unless. Unless, yes, or except as the AV has it. Yes, that's absolutely right. And that, that word keeps being repeated, actually, as we continue through the dialogue. So, so it's a conversation about, um, about requirements about conditions isn't it about what must be the case in order for something else to be so that's like a pivot on which the dialogue 
turns. So that's one. There's one other. This is a very small word, this one. God is there, absolutely right. Yeah, we'll come. We'll come to that one. It's actually a, it's actually a, a, an opposite. So there's a can and there's a cannot. And, and, and actually, I think the first can should be <laughs> it kind of is a cannot because because it, it's no one can, which really means um, one cannot, right? So 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 Nicodemus talks about what cannot be the case unless you're from God. It cannot be the case that you do miracles. And Jesus says, um, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then Nicodemus says, can, uh, how can a man be born? He can't enter, he cannot enter the second time into his mother's womb, can he? And Jesus then says, um, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter so it's all about the whole dialogue is about cans and cannots mostly cannots as we go through this so so it's actually not two people missing that, that actually every every part of the conversation there's connections between what one says and what the other one says right and and that's that's part of what's what's clever about it i, th I think it's, it's almost like a word game that jesus and nicodemus well really jesus is having the word game and nicodemus is trying to keep up I, I would say, and, and really fails to keep up. But the point is that he can think about it afterwards, isn't it? He can reflect on this conversation for the rest of his life. And your and my experience of reading the Bible can be like that, can't it? That there are parts of it that we can't keep up with just now, maybe. But, but through time, by reflection and attention and meditation and study it gradually opens to us doesn't it and we, and we start to see things oh that's what it was getting at and that's just one of the beautiful things about engaging with the scriptures so let's look then at uh, again at nicodemus's opening opening piece here Rabbi, and we'll read it again, we know that you are a teacher come from God, but no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So what do people do when they begin conversations with people they don't know? Uh, well, sometimes they try to establish credibility, don't they? And that's what he does. We know. He, he sets himself as part of a group because he is an important man, isn't he, in worldly terms? He's a ruler of the Jews. That probably means he's a member of the Sanhedrin. He is a teacher of Israel, as Jesus points out to him later in the chapter. But he doesn't quite dare go with, I know. He wants to hide behind the safety of the group. This is what we know. And we're a smart bunch of people because we've discerned that unless this is the case, then this cannot be the case. And therefore, you must be a man uh, come from God. Do you see how that's establishing his own credibility um, and, and the rational process that he's been through? And it's like establishing a baseline for the conversation. This is what we know. These are our presuppositions here. We've got to be careful with that, haven't we? Because uh, there, are, there are limits to what we know, as Nicodemus is very quick to discover once he starts to talk with Jesus. We can assume we know many things that we may not in fact know or may not actually be the full perspective on a matter. And it's only by uh, God revealing things to us that we can have the knowledge uh, that we need. So what he's also doing here, and this is another sort of conventional way of starting a conversation, is there's a bit of a compliment to the other party that you're talking to. Ah, you're a teacher come from God. I, I, I recognize you. I'm a teacher. You're a teacher. Uh, there's, there's a basis for a conversation here. Do you think there's something of that going on here as well? And to compliment Jesus by saying, you are a teacher come from God. So what does jesus have to say about that well jesus begins his response 
by saying, truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say to you, which is how Jesus begins each of his three statements uh, in, the, in, in the passage. So, in the, and by saying, truly, truly, I say to you, see, there's a contrast. We know, we know, um, the safety of the crowd, the received wisdom of the rabbis, of the rabbis' deduction and learning. Jesus doesn't need to hide behind any group identity, does he? He speaks the truth um, because he knows it intrinsically, because he is from God. He doesn't need to carry out the kind of deductions, wrong or right, that Nicodemus has to step through. Jesus truly knows how it is. And he says then now, unless or except you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus now introduces seemingly gratuitously the idea of being born again. Nicodemus hadn't been talking about being born again, have he? No, he hadn't. But he had been talking about origins. He'd been talking about where Jesus came from, hadn't he? And, and, and Jesus is now twisting that and, 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 and saying, let's not worry about where I came from. Let's think about where you need to come from if you want to see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says, you came from God in the past. And Nicodemus says, let's, and Jesus says, let's not worry about that. This is what you need to focus on. How do you get into the kingdom of God? Not where you come from, but how you enter the future. Not the past, but the future. Entering the kingdom of God, Nicodemus, that's what you need to focus on. And that fits with what we know and what we sing, doesn't it? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus encourages Nicodemus to focus on then. And in order to enter the kingdom of God, and enter now becomes a key word, doesn't it? Another of these words that the conversation hinges on. Um, in order to enter the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. And that word be born now is going to be used eight times in these eight verses of, of John chapter three. So one for every, every verse, effectively, that's what it averages out to. Jesus puts in some ambiguity here because he says, unless one is born again, and some translations you'll notice will say from above, um, and it is just a word with two meanings. It can mean again, or it can mean from above. Which do you think is the meaning that Nicodemus is going to pick? He's going to pick the, he's going to pick the natural meaning, isn't he? Because that's the level that he's on at the moment. He's going to take Jesus to mean be born again. And that's not wrong. We do have to be born again, don't we, in baptism. Um, but that being born again, of course, will not be a natural birth as we were born the first time. It will be a birth from above. It will be a spiritual birth. And that's the other meaning of that word. So Jesus plays on that ambiguity now. Now, later on, at the, at the, in the end of the gospel, somewhere in chapter 19, that word is used again when Jesus clearly means it to mean from above. Uh, but here, of course, uh, Nicodemus takes it the other way. So Nicodemus now says then, his second um, speech now in verse 4, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So again, we notice that he's focusing on what can be the case. Um, and, and that idea can, cannot, we've already seen that, haven't we? Five times in these verses, that idea is, is, is used. And do you, do you see what's happening again? Jesus is trying to lift Nicodemus's perceptions, like forget about where I came from, think about what you need to do to enter the kingdom of God. For that, you need to be born again. And, but Nicodemus immediately takes the idea of being born again or being born from above back to the earth. So, well, I, yeah, I know about being born. I was taught about that. Um, 
And now he frames the question in those terms, isn't he? In the terms of what he knows, what he's familiar with, what takes place down here. And therefore comes up with this ridiculous notion of entering your mother's womb a second time, which, you know, you don't even want to think about that. Um, but that's where, that's where Nicodemus takes it into this, you know, this contradictory notion. And, and again, Jesus has to say, no, no, let's not talk about entering your mother's womb. Let's talk about, let's talk about entering the kingdom of God. And for that, you need to be born in a completely different way. And then Jesus will go on to explain what that is. Um, so where you came from becomes entering the kingdom. Nicodemus brings that down again to entering your mother's womb. Jesus takes it up again to entering into uh, the kingdom of God. And for that, you need to be born again or from above. We've seen that. And you need to be born, as Jesus will explain in verse 5, of water and spirit. And unless you are, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So, so why, did, why did Nicodemus introduce this idea of entering into your mother's womb the second time? Was he, was he trying to mock Jesus? Uh, possibly. I, I, I don't think so. I think for me, it's just, he's just not able to break the mental circle he's drawn for himself, is he? He's, he's trapped by the here and now. This is the way things work. This is what we know as a bunch of rabbis. We can, you know, this is the received wisdom. We can, you know, start with these premises and we can reach these conclusions. This is how things are. And this is where I am safe. And this is where I will lead my mental existence. And what Jesus does repeatedly in the Gospel of John and elsewhere, and I'm sure we'll, we'll see it in Brother Roger's talk as well, is to break that barrier. Or that, that we surround ourselves with and, and, and to say, no, there's a whole, there's a whole new other world out there that is, that is so much more real than the mental constructs that you're living your limited, uh, mental life in right now. And uh, is, is what Jesus is, is what Jesus is saying to, um, to Nicodemus. So Jesus turns everything around doesn't he then in this conversation he turns the natural to the spiritual he turns what is beneath to what is above he changes the paradigm of thought and this really is the it, it is so important for us isn't it that that we too do not like nicodemus allow ourselves to be trapped by the limitations of what we know, you know, of what human beings have deduced thus far, because uh, human beings don't know the things of uh, the spirit. They do not know the things of God. The natural man does not know those things. We can only know those things if they are revealed to us. And that's why we have the scriptures and that's why uh, we focus upon them. And you know, we can look at Nicodemus and, and we can smile, can't we, at him, as he says, come on into my mother's womb a second time. But what we have to make sure is that we learn the lesson from this, uh, that in, in some ways, the way that we can be inclined to reason about things can be, can be this illogical. Of course, Jesus wasn't talking about that, we know. But how often in our own thinking do we, do we limit what God can do? Do we make assumptions about how things must be? Do we spend our time just thinking about things on this plane? Um, you know, about wallpaper and what's for breakfast and what's on Facebook and what meeting I have at 10.30 and, 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 and all those things of daily life. And that becomes this prison really uh, for my mental life where where Jesus came to free us from that, to liberate us into the wonderful things of salvation and godly thinking. So then let's move uh, towards a conclusion then as we think uh, briefly about uh, verse 5, uh, and, and, uh, five 6, and, and 7. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, 
he cannot enter the kingdom of God. There's no future in flesh, is there? Flesh can only beget flesh. There has to be a different kind of birth. It's no good being born again in exactly the same way as we were born the first time. There has to be a paradigm shift. And we will not fathom it. We, we will not, with our frames of reference, be able to see it. The wind blows, and then of course there's that plague, because the same word means wind and spirit, doesn't it? The wind and spirit, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. So, so we don't understand how conversion works, do we? We don't understand why some people come to believe and to accept, and, and some people don't. But just as we can see the effects of the wind. So we pray that when we look around, we can see the effects of the work of God in the lives of people who have been converted, that this person, this brother, that sister would never have said that, would never have acted that way had they not known Jesus. And it has transformed the way they are. And we pray for each of us that it has transformed the way that I am and you are, the way we think, the way we act, the things we do because of this rebirth. We must be born of water and spirit. And, and, and you know, people have thought different things about that, haven't they? Some have thought there is a, a, a water birth, which is talking about baptism. And then some have thought that there is a, there is a spirit birth, which is about what happens when we're clothed with immortality at, at, at the kingdom. I, I, I'm more inclined to think that the water and spirit birth is one birth. It, it is speaking about con, conversion. And, and that is a spiritual process. It's not a natural thing, is it? We're not born of flesh the second time in that sense. We're born of spirit. Peter talks in 1 Peter 1 and verse 23, he talks about how we are born again by the living and active word of God. I see that as being a, a parallel idea to what we have here in John. Titus in 3 verse 5 talks about the washing of regeneration, an obvious reference to, to baptism, and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And he's talking about the renewing, i.e. the forgiveness of of our sins, which which happens by the power of God, because God says it will be so. That is a, a, a spiritual process. That is what is involved in spiritual rebirth. And there are other passages as well uh, that speak of repentance, uh, that speak and salvation, that speak of water and spirit. For example, in Ezekiel 36 and Isaiah 44. Let's. Um, let, let's again just just think about um, the, 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 the exhortation that there is here as we transition to, to Jesus third, uh, the third part of, of, of Jesus speech. Nicodemus now asks his third question in verse nine. How can these things be? And I think now then, hopefully we, 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 we can get the point as to why the words of Nicodemus become less and why the words of Jesus become more because Nicodemus realizes that he, he realizes inadequacy to be able to rationalize and explain these things. He realizes he's in a domain that it is, that is beyond uh, human uh, rationality. And, you know, this is important for us because we live very much in a, an intellectual culture of we know, don't we? You know, we know how it is. There is a received authority that comes to us from, you know, what science knows and what the culture knows about what is right and wrong. And, 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 and our duty is not to accept the we know uh, just because humans have said it, uh, but rather to think uh, what it is that God has to say about things. And we must um, be born again. We have to then, th 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 there's this, there must be this distancing of ourselves, must there, of course, from the past and from our, from, from our sins, uh, but, but also from a paradigm 
uh, you know, from a way of thinking and acting into this new uh, existence that, that Jesus offers. We can't just keep going the same way, can we? I remember when I was a, when I was a, I was a kid and, uh, you know, I, was trying, I would try to saw a piece of wood and there'd be this straight line that I was trying to cut. And my dad would say to me, look at the line, let the saw do the work, let the saw do the work, don't put pressure on it. And I would try to follow the line, but my cut would always go off. And, and you know what happens if you keep sawing? You can never get it back to the line, can you? Uh, you it's, you're just going to go further and further away. And, and, and that's why we have to be born again. Oh, it's the same with a child doing homework and trying to do a drawing and you know, you run the line in the wrong place. You keep adding more lines, you just make more and more of a mess, don't you? And, and at, at a certain point, you just have to start over. And God has given us that opportunity through the Lord Jesus Christ of making that new beginning. How can these things be? not through anything that humans can do, not through human wisdom, but through the power of God, because the Lord Jesus Christ was lifted up. And later on, of course, Nicodemus himself would see the Lord lifted up and would come to appreciate everything that that meant and would come to prepare Jesus for his burial and for everything that would follow. Uh, and that's of course, where we'll pick things up in, uh, in, in the third talk.